Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll um, go ahead and, and get going and we'll see who, who else pops on. Um, so before we get started, I want to announce that our meeting for next month will not be on July 4th. <laughs> so uh, we're going to move it to the second Thursday of the month, which is July 11th. And our speaker is going to be another farmer presenter. Um, I'm super excited about this. We're going to have Jordan Setledge from St. Mary's in, and um, he's going to talk about some pasture management technology that he's been working with and kind of testing out and um, how that's kind of helped him manage his pastures a little better and, you know, also improve the technology for other users. So um, that'll be great. He's a really fun person and uh, very, very much uh, research minded. So um, look forward to having him on the meeting on July 11th. So uh, I'm also going to pop in the chat here in a second, um, the OFA tour book. So they do a, if you're not familiar with it, OFA does a nice series of farm tours every summer um, and a lot of variety all over the state up into Michigan. So um, surely you can find one that looks interesting to you. And um, Michelle, or Michelle, sorry, Denise, sorry, I, I did not sleep well last night. I'm just going to disclose that <laughs> if I mess anything up, I apologize in advance. Um, Denise, did you want to announce that specialty crop opportunity? Sure. So um, Central State is working on a grant right now that looking at utilizing manure as a natural fertilizer um, for specialty crop farmers and is looking for farmers to participate in this study. It is a climate smart um, agriculture practice study. We're looking for folks that are growing vegetables starting in fall 2024 um, and it'll go through 2028. I'm going to put a little blurb in um, the chat that explains some more details um, and then the, the real thing about this is um, that as one of the central state programs, we are really looking to recruit um, socially disadvantaged or veteran farmers in this um, project. And that it, it's actually kind of cool because you don't have to have a ton of space to participate. Um, you have to provide at least 3000 square feet of space. Um, so a small scale farm, a large scale farm, rural, urban, um, lots of possibilities. Um, but I wanted to put it out there to this group and then share the word as we are recruiting. So and thank you, Kathy. I'm just gonna add something. That, that grant is already funded. So it's funded. They're just looking for a total of 20 farmers and we have seven already. Awesome. Hopefully we can get the rest you need. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and um, that's Matt Falb. And he's um, he does row, organic row crops and um, some pastured beef uh, over here in my neck of the woods in um, uh, Wayne County. So he farms in Oroville with his father. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt and uh, let him tell us what he's going to tell us. Matt, if you're talking, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, I haven't I haven't talked yet. Uh, I'm just going back Perfect. to the beginning. Okay, does that look good? Um, I'm sharing the screen. Yep, looks good. Okay, great. So I just wanted to start off um, with an introduction about the farm. Cassie covered a little bit of it. Um, I my farm is in 80 acres uh, in Wayne County, Ohio, uh, which is I guess north central or northeast Ohio, depending on how you look at it, how divide, you divide up the state. Um, I am, uh, the farm has been in my family since 1907. I'm the fourth generation. So I feel, you know, really fortunate to, to have that, you know, have that family history with the land. Um, my farm has, is, is diversified in the sense it has both crops and livestock. Um, we started on the crop production side, we started the organic, or we started the transition process to organic production in 2008. And our first year of certified uh, organic crops were in 2011 growing season. 
Um, we've more or less had a seven year uh, rotation over the years. Um, we have a perennial mixed grass alfalfa hay um, for four years. And then typically after in year five, it goes into corn. In year six, um, I, I call it an annual year. So in the past, we've grown small grains. We've also, um, weather permitting, grow peas and oats in the spring. And then in the summer, a lot we've started doing more with uh, summer, uh, summer annuals, uh, sorghum Sudan grass. And then in the fall, we typically put plant a cover crop, a legume-based cover crop, as a plow down following spring for corn in year seven. Um, and then the, the, on the livestock side, we have a herd of about 60 head of beef cattle. Uh, we have a cow-calf finish operation. Um, for, for those of you that aren't in the cattle world, um, it means that we have breeding stock, and then they have calves every year, and then we raise the calves from birth to finish. Um, and for us, that is the finish is typically 24 months. Uh, we we uh, feed our, our cattle all forage, uh, so we are a grass-fed, grass-finished operation. Um, an important part of management for me is practicing managed intensive grazing. So I'm being intentional about how much residue I'm leaving after a grazing event, and then also how much rest is being given when the, before the cattle come back to any spot on, on a paddock or pasture, piece of pasture. Um, and then also probably in the last five years, we've become uh, more intentional about integrating the grazing within the crop rotation. So uh, we'll stockpile hay in the fall and let the cattle graze to extend the grazing season well into the fall um, and also graze corn residue uh, for, with dry cows uh, well into the fall. So just kind of giving you a sense of, of where we're, our, our, our farm is at. Um, the question or the, uh, the, the project that I'll be presenting on today, um, so I think it's important to, you know, talk about things that are don't always go well um, and then how we try to learn from our mistake or learn from things that don't always go well instead of just throwing our hands up in the air and say that didn't work. So that's that's kind of the framework for where um, we'll be talking about or I'll be presenting on. Um, so, you know, um, following or adopting the principles of soil health have, have been and are, are a priority for us on, on the on the operation. You know, having a perennial in the rotation has, you know, living roots and having soil armor on the ground. Um, you know, we've adopted cover crops uh, as growing a source of fertility. We see it as a source of fertility for corn. And then livestock integration has been, as mentioned earlier, has been an important part for us in kind of building our soil health. Um, where, you know, I see the, you know, I see it as an, an essential component in the sense that I'm trying to build resiliency for the increased volatility caused by climate change or attributed to climate change. Um, you know, I, I think it's clear to me that I will have to farm differently than, you know, my, maybe my parents and definitely my grandparents did. And so just trying to position, trying to best position my operation for, you know, the unknown volatility that's probably, that's here already. Um, one of the things that we've, feel like we fall down on is in terms of the soil health principles, our soil disturbance. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of kind of what, what, what I mean by soil disturbance, so especially in the corn years, um, so that's year five and seven of the rotation. So pre-planting, we, we moldboard plow um, the, the alfalfa ground, um, and then we do finish tillage, so that usually two or three passes over the field. And then post planting, you know, we do a lot of mechanical cultivation or weed control. So we, and ideally we we hit the field pre-emergence with a tine weeder, and then rotary hoe once the corn is a little up a little bit, and then two passes of cultivating. And then in our annual year, um, you know, we do at least two diskings um, and then fin finish tillage per year. So it's you know it's a lot of passes and a lot of soil disturbance, especially on top. Um, you know, we've kind of lived with, you know, there's always some tension and probably, in, you know, there's, or there's management trade-offs in every um, operation. And so, you know, we're trying to kind of find that balance or at least philosophically and also from a soil health perspective, 
find that balance between soil health and you know what what we're trying to accomplish on the farm. So corn is is a valuable crop for me as a cash crop, and also as mentioned earlier, it provides uh, extension, a seed grazing extent season gra grazing season extension. You know, well into the fall, I usually get 45 to 60 days of grazing from corn residue after the corn harvest with my dry cows. Um, and then, you know, from from the annual perspective, um, you know, we 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 use some, especially sorghum Sudan, as a high energy forage uh, for for beef that's required to get adequate finish on our beef cattle. So, just some some more context. Um, so kind of diving in deeper of thinking about solutions uh, to to reducing our the amount of soil disturbance in our rotation. Um, you know, I've kind of bits and pieces in different places learning about the roller crimper uh, option as a method for terminating cover crops uh, prior to planting a cash crop. So, I, you know, there's a really great resource uh, published by the Rodale Institute, um, the uh, roller crimper no-till by Jeff Moyer, kind of gives it, giving some of the nuts and bolts of, of all the considerations that, you know, growers need to have when, when thinking about doing cover crop termination. Um, I'm always, you know, I think book, uh, using the book, having a book as a reference is great, but it's also, you know, it was really, so we also kind of tried to network with other farms doing it um, and kind of getting into some of their, their um, pro, uh, perspectives and, and what they've been doing or what they see as critical. Um, so, you know, we pre learned pretty quickly that, you know, maturity, and, and species of cover crops are important to, to get an adequate crimp or termination. Um, and then, you know, some of the corn plants or modifications that we needed to think about or equipment modifications that we needed to think about. So, um, so I think, you know, that kind of the, the crimper the possibility was appealing to me because we are already doing um, a cover crop, a fall planted cover crop. Um, that was predominantly hairy vetch and rye and crimson clover and those were all species that you know given with enough maturity with enough uh, bloom you know would be would be be able to terminate it with crimping um so that that was kind of a you know set, uh, easy path for us you know we have experience with hairy vetch um and rye so that that kind of felt like things were aligning within what we were doing in the operation um, the next kind of piece to, to solve was getting access to a roller crimper. Um, you know, I think there are some available to rent, you know, I think soil and water, I know soil and water districts have some, um, but the problem is everybody else is trying to get it at the same time, you know, I am. And so that, that had a challenge. Um, and then also, you know, for me to buy, go out and buy my own, um, you know, I've, in, in my calculation, it's cost prohibitive. I only grow 10 to 15 acres of corn every year. So going out and buying a, a crimper was probably not the best option for me. Um, and then, you know, kind of, uh, you know, what maybe luck or, you know, I have a conventional dairy neighbor uh, who committed to going no-till, uh, I think in the last two or three years. And so he actually bought a roller crimper on his own in 2023 and has been willing to rent it out. So that kind of, kind of the stars aligned on, the, on that front as well. So in the 2023 growing season, um, we decided to, to take a stab, to roll the dice and take a stab at, at putting out a no-till corn plot, organic no-till corn plot. Um, you know, I had 12 acres of conventional tillage corn. And then, you know, I, I, I'm I'm a, a risk adverse person in some ways, and so you know putting a very small third you know one third acre plot of corn at the end of a field with that was already in conventional tillage seemed to make sense. So that's that's where so we started small, just to try it. And I'm and you know as you'll find out later, I'm very glad I did not mortgage the farm and put all twelve acres in in organic no till corn. So. Um, Kind of what you know my my expectations you know i thought oh you know the no-till corn should you know compare favorably with you know what we're doing you know conventional tillage uh we had a good um cover crop established in in september of 2022 the picture on the left shows we had about 
you know, 40, 50 inch, 48, 50 inches of biomass on top of the ground. Um, this was there. We crimped, I think, at least a week or two later because we need we need adequate or at least 75 percent bloom um, to, to get an adequate termination. So we waited to crimp until May 31st when we had that kind of uh, level of blooming. Um, we felt we had good termination of the cover crop. It, the vetch and the rye stayed down. We crimped it, stayed down, starting to wilt and, and get yellow. And then we started planting on uh, the same day that we crimped. So we knocked the, the cover crop down and then planted directly into the into the crimped crop. So, uh, so then getting into kind of the, the unexpected outcomes. Um, so we, or my part of the state got fairly dry last spring, uh, at the end of May and early June. I think there was about 17 days without rain. Uh, we, I think what we, when we planted, it may, maybe we were in day five or day six of the dry period. Uh, so the ground was, was fairly hard. And in our experiences previously with uh, tilling and plowing vetch, um, vetch tends to suck, suck the moisture out of the ground. So it felt like it made the ground that much harder. Um, and so we, we tried uh, going in with our planter. Our planter has a no-till no cultures and we couldn't get the seed in. We couldn't even penetrate the, the ground with the seed. Um, and so the same neighbor with the, the crimper um, let us borrow his, his um, planter and he actually loaded his insecticide boxes with, with sand to add a little more down pressure in. So we were able, felt like we were able to get the seed into the ground at least. And we, we got more aggressive. We planted probably a little bit deeper than we would usually would. You know, the conventional wisdom is to plant deeper in dry conditions. So we, we felt like we got maybe the corn seed in the ground two and a half inches or so. Or, yeah. Um, so you know, one of the things we also didn't, you know, the, the, in general, what Rodale's book was pushing was, was planting after crimping. And so we found out that it's really, the, the crimping makes a lot of lines in the field. So it's really hard to see uh, your rows uh, at, at, if you plant after crimping. So it almost took two of us to mark the, the last row and then to swing around to the field and come back the other way. We, you know, it's it just a nightmare to try to figure out, make a straight row and, and make it, you know, uniform a, a distance between rows. Um, and then we, so we had, um, you know, we were patiently waiting, waited and waited for the corn to come up. Um, and we found, you know, so we had really poor germination and emergence. Uh, we only had about 10% uh, emergence after two weeks. So, you know, obviously it looked like a disaster. Um, you know, in our conventionally tilled fields, we also had uneven germination and emergence, but the emergence was much better, uh, or, you know, it was probably, not, you know, 80, 90%. So, um, yeah, this was uh, not not a pleasant experience for us. Uh, so just kind of to recap, you know, what what we felt like went right and what went wrong, um, you know, what went right, you know, we got a, a good crimp, or we, I should say we also had our neighbor who had a little bit more experience um, looking at no-till corn with us come over and kind of help, help us try to diagnose and problem solve what happened. Um, so I, you know, felt like what went right, you know, it, in our opinion, in his opinion, we had good term. And then, so, you know, I spent a lot less time and fuel doing field operations. We were done in one pass. And then, you know, the biodiversity under the thatch of the cover crop, the crimped cover crop was amazing. You know, all the life underneath the earthworms, the insects, uh, just was, was really neat to see. Um, and then what went wrong? You know, so we, you know, some things maybe were out of our control, like dry field conditions, and then, you know, knowing the risk of the batch and being, sucking the water out of, of the field, um, you know, probably compounded some of that. Um, so, you know, then seeing, you know, finding seed in the ground that was probably a little bit too deep uh, or, you know, that maybe didn't get enough moisture. And then we also wondered about, uh, cover crop uh, thatch mulching out sunlight. I, I do not have row cleaners on the planter. And so wondered if, you know, having row cleaners kind of pushing the, the moving the, 
the biomass aside would would give more uh, access, you know, more give the seedlings a head start. So those are kind of some considerations that we had kind of moving forward. Um, so I, I wasn't ready to just throw in the towel and say I gave it a good run. Um, you know, we decided to, you know, we, we, we felt there was enough promising things, enough benefits to try it again in, in 2024 or this growing season. So on a different field, we got, uh, you know, we sat, did our typical fall planting of the cover crop in September of 2023. Um, I also, try, you know, I, 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 was, I had some discomfort with waiting until May 31st to, to plant. And so I studied the seed catalogs and looked for earlier maturing varieties of hairy vetch and, and rye to try to move up that planting date or crimping date. Um, and so we, we put the hairy vetch in about the early maturing variety of hairy vetch in about 10 pounds to the acre and rye was about a bushel uh, an acre. And then it, we put in some crimson clover as well. Um, and we also, so, you know, I, we've typically done fall planted cover crops, seeing it as a more safe option for, uh, growing fertility or growing nitrogen and fixing nitrogen in the soil prior to corn. Um, we had the opportunity in March of this year to, uh, get into the ground and do some field work. And we sowed, uh, oats and peas mixture at a hundred pounds per acre. Uh, as we were, when we planted it, we mainly thought of it as a forage. Um, but as kind of May evolved, it really, you know, really shot up in biomass and we were able, we ended up doing a, a half acre at the end of the field to have a second no-till corn plot. Um, so this year we're planning, we have nine acres of conventional tillage corn, and then we have two no-till plots totaling an acre and a half. Um, and so we we also tried to mix it up a little bit this year so in in our vetch rye crop we planted green we we planted before we crimped and it was quite a bit easier to see the rows um than than it was you know laying the vetch down first um so that was that was an interest and our and our neighbor does that as well so that was kind of based on his his recommendation these are some pictures of what we were doing. Um, so on, so so I was a little disappointed with the the early maturing varieties. I didn't feel like we got uh, it didn't really move up the planting date that much. Uh, we planted on May twenty eighth. Uh, picture on the left is shows that, and then we crimped it uh, on May thirtieth. So this is what our rye and vetch uh, cover look looks like or looked like. Um, and then some pictures on the peas. Um, we had, I, I would say we probably had about three feet of biomass on top. The peas are just starting to flower at this picture. This is actually the picture of when I crimped it. Um, and the oats is starting to, to head out. Uh, and then the picture on the right is, is after, after the crimping um, on May 30th. I would say that the, we've probably we've jumped the gun a little bit on on the peas and the oats, the oats started to stand up, or I think the peas stayed down, but the, the oats uh, started coming back up a little bit uh, after planting. Um, so some initial observations um, related to our rye vetch cover crop plots. Um, we had some issues with seed placements um, in the sense that we found seeds dropped outside of the row, and it looked like it was spots where the, the no-till culture didn't cut through the residue. Um, and so, you know, it makes me wonder if, if that's the next, if, if I'm really going to go, you know, if, if I go farther, you know, I need to think about row cleaners to kind of move the, the biomass aside uh, to get more consistent seed placement. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm also seeing slower germination this year. Uh, I, on Monday, we were in the field looking and didn't, after six, this would have been after six days of planting, you know, the seed kernels are starting to soften, but we didn't see a lot of evidence of germination where, you know, compared to our conventional tillage field, we had emergence after six days of planting. So, you know, my neighbor keeps telling me, you know, things need to, or it's, it's a slower process and need to be patient, but 
hopefully we'll you know maybe go out today or tomorrow and see more germination um, than what we saw on Monday. Uh, and then the oats and peas plot, uh, we planted uh, May 30th. Um, you know, like I said, we crimped, felt we crimped a little bit early. Um, and so we're trying to decide if we want to go back with the with the crimper again and just not try to knock things back or or somehow slice slice it up a little bit better to give the, the corn a chance through the, through the residue. Um, so that that's kind of the end of my of the no-till part of no-till corn part. Um, I am you know excited about some collaborations that we have planned in 2024. Um, I am a Warner Grant recipient, um, so we this is uh, the project that we're looking doing is kind of a spinoff on the livestock integration study that was led by Dr. Doug Jackson Smith. Um, I was a collaborator on that project and. You know, what I really appreciated about the study was I got access to uh, biological uh, indicators of soil um, in, in, from the study, you know, soil respiration, active carbon, um, some protein uh, data. And so, you know, it kind of really uh, sparked my interest and wanted to learn more about how biology is helping drive nutrient cycling in my system, an organic system. Um, and so we're we're looking we're sampling soils uh, at three times so May August and October and we're using utilizing laboratory analysis to look at um, respiration or the Haney test look at some nutrient cycling and respiration data from from this Haney test as well as the phospholipid uh, test the PLLFA test looking at uh, ratios of fungus to bacteria, and then also some nematode, uh, looking at nematode communities, knowing that nematodes, you know, help regulate the, the fungus and bacteria population. There's bacterial feeders and fungal feeders of nematodes. So just trying to look at different layers of the soil food web and how, you know, the communities are, are maybe working together or maybe competing, and then, you know, looking at some, some nutrient availability, you know, it, throughout the, at different points in the growing season. We're comparing results from a, a, we have a perennial pasture that was also part of the IDEAS project um, that's been in pasture for 30 years. And then we also have the other field that the comparison is a, a field that was in the seven year crop rotation. And it's just coming out of that seventh year, the, that second time of corn and going into the kind of the perennial part of my, my crop rotation. So. Yeah, I'm I'm interested, really interested in diving into the data and seeing, you know, what, you know, you, you know, what, yeah, what are the differences, if any? Um, and I'm, you know, have a fortunate, be, I'm very fortunate to have a relationship with uh, the Ohio State investigator, Dr. Ryan Hayden, to help me think through, you know, some of these and interpreting the results and the analysis. So, um, another kind of collaboration here in 2024 is a carbon sequestration study. Uh, led by Dr. Ricardo. I, I, I don't want to butcher his last name too much, um, but they've, he's been looking at, he's wanting to look at carbon levels in the top 24 inches of the soil profile. Um, they came out and, and did some soil data collection this spring. And so it's, it's really, I, I got, I kind of shadowed them for an afternoon, kind of seeing what their methods were. And it's, it's not often that I get to see soil uh, 24 inches down. So it's it's neat to kind of see you know what 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 things look like and we were actually fortunate to have uh, this this uh, during one of the cores that they were taking um, we found a in in one of the cores an earthworm channel or um, to you know I think this was at least twenty four or at least twelve inches down and you know I see some root hairs in the soil and we actually. Uh, the investigator said it was very really rare to see the earthworm that deep or, or actually spot the earthworm. So these pictures kind of show to what my my soil is looking like. So it's it, you know allows me to geek out a little bit about soil. So and that's the end of How, my which field was that in? Uh, that was in, uh, in a crop rotation. It was in a hay field, um, okay. but it wasn't part of the ideas project. Oh, okay, was, different. Yeah, field. different one. Yep. Anyone have any questions or comments about any anything Matt presented on? 
I actually have a, a question and a comment for you, Matt. I, I would agree with the row cleaner suggestion. Uh, we've tried to do pumpkins through rye, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem like they're strong enough to poke up through very reliably, you know, or, or fast enough. Uh, so my dad said the same thing. He's like, I haven't used the row cleaner in years, but I need to put them back on for that. Um, and then my question is, and I apologize if you touched on this and I didn't hear it, but what does uh, your mid to even late season weed pressure look like on your crimp fields? Do you have much of a weed pressure or is everything shaded out pretty well? So it, in the, the 2023 um, plot that we had last year, it actually did a really nice, I mean, the weeds were pretty suppressed. Like we had a pretty thick mat thatch on the ground. And I mean, I think it would have been amazing if, if I would have had better germination and more canopy, but considering the absence of the canopy, I think, you know, I, I, we were pleasantly surprised at how well the, the, the thatch mulched things out. We actually had, I, I had turnips it also planted uh, expecting it to winter kill. And I saw turnips that grew sideways out of the thatch and, um, you know, came up and, and produced these, you know, enormous uh, leaves above ground. And my cattle, I grazed it after the corn came off and the cattle loved chowing down on, on some of these, these turnips. Awesome. Thanks. Matt, Deb Steiner here. So are you using uh, manure for fertility or how did your fertility management, are you all, uh, you know, plant-based grass uh, legume for your corn? For the corn? Um, yeah, in the, in the hay years, the, in the hay part of the rotation, we, we try to spread manure, get the fields covered once a year. Um, but we don't, as far as the year going, it, the, the, uh, summer and the annual year where we're uh, then putting the cover crop down, we typically don't spread manure on those fields. And, you know, maybe naively, but thinking that the vetch and, and the rye will, will have provide, you know, the, the nutrient cycling that we need. Um, we're, we're typically in the 150 bushel corn range. Um, and so that, you know, yep. yeah. And so we're not, um, you know, what, what, what's kind of prompted interest in some of this follow-up study with Dr. Hayden was, you know, following the traditional chemistry of agronomy standards of, you know, knowing what units we need for expected yield of nitrogen, units of nitrogen, you know, we're not putting anywhere near that on in mm -hmm. terms of beef manure. And, you know, maybe the batch is providing us some, but, you know, I think we we're just trying to understand how biology is driving nutrient cycling, get a better mm -hmm. handle on that. Mm -hmm. Matt, er Eric Reeker, uh, farm management field specialist with OSU and also organic farmer. Um, we're hey, hopefully in this new study uh, with, with Ryan Hayden, you may do some evaluation of nutrient production or capture with the, the cover crops or, or not necessarily. Um, not I mean, on the Haney test, there's estimates of available organic carbon and organic nitrogen, and then it gives a ratio of that. Um, I None of the fields are in or corn. It's um, one of the fields is a perennial pasture and the other field is, is a new seeding of hay. Um, and so, you know, I won't necessarily have that for um, a corn field. It would be interesting to see what uh, the, the soil uh, soil nitrogen is from from or organic nitrogen produced from the vetch is and right. perhaps compare that to uh, you know your four years of of hay production is the hay all alfalfa or it's a mixed hay it's a mix um, typically you know fescues orchard grass and then alfalfa and red clovers are in our mix seems like that would have a good nitrogen credit too that would be very interesting with yeah. regard to your no-till, uh, we we experienced very similar germination problems. We did like a 10-acre uh, crimped rye with organic no-till soybeans last year. So ours was with soybeans, slow emergence, I mean, painfully slow. 
um, and, and we're watching our conventional till beans come up and just uh, had, yeah, just, just wanted to echo that we had similar uh, struggles a year ago um, to the point that we didn't try any uh, crimped rye this year. It kind of scared us enough in the soybeans that we felt like it was almost a 15, 12 to 15 bushel yield drag. Um, but uh, interesting to try. The one comment I'll say on that I've heard other farmers say on row cleaners is, is that if you, if you expose that soil to sunlight, you expose that field to weed germination. Yeah. And so uh, we went in last year with our row cleaners. We had row cleaners on our planter and we threw them all the way up uh, in the organic no-till soybeans because we didn't we didn't want to push any rye out of the way. We wanted we wanted the press wheels to kind of roll that that rye down right as they were. And and then the next day or day, two days later, we crimped. Um, I, based on the right planting date and, and thesis and all that good stuff. So um, very interesting work. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Uh, Cassie, I don't know if you have access from uh, Kathy's old files uh, from field day reports, but uh, John Cardina did a number of different mechanical implements and I think he was mostly focused on that, but he did a number of experiences uh, of experiments on our organic research land. Uh, I believe it was Fort Unit Two. It was in, it was close to campus, not West Badger. But it would be interesting. I can't remember. I know there was one, and I can't remember. It was a crimper or a roller, but one of the implements made a difference. And he was looking primarily at uh, rye and soybeans, what you're talking about, uh, Eric. Not, I don't remember any of us doing what you're doing, Matt, but this is, this is very cool stuff, very cool stuff. And it would be, I agree with Eric, it'd be awesome for someone to be looking pretty uh, in-depth at the nitrogen cycling, because if you're getting 150 bushels of organic corn, you're doing, you're doing very well, I would say. I, I'll add on to that. Um, one of the things Matt had mentioned the ideas project with uh, Dr. Doug Jackson Smith. One of the things we're hoping to do with that data is map out some of those nutrient cycles um, based on all the data we've collected in these many fields throughout the state the last two years. So something we're looking forward to and something that I know Jim Ippolito and um, Manbir Ricard are looking at adding to the tri-state fertility guide which I'm happy to hear from them. So um, hopefully some good things coming in that arena. Cool. Um, any other questions, comments? All right, that was great, Matt. Appreciate you uh, sharing. And um, yeah, that was excellent. I think we're gonna shift gears and uh, move on to our next speaker then. And if you think of some other questions for Matt, um, Feel free to pop them in the chat and you can kind of watch that. So our next speaker uh, speakers, Betsy Rosser and Van Slack um, from the same soil and water conservation district and involved in the urban greens program, or not just involved, but leading the urban greens program, which is an urban agriculture program in Wiskingham County and in Zanesville more specifically. So these are partners I get to work with in our Central State Beginning Farmers Program, but just so much amazing work being done um, on a really special farm that we have in um, Wiskingham County, just outside of Zanesville. And I got to stop by a few times and do some workshops and saw this um, small grains variety trial and thought this is exactly what our network here, the Farmer Researcher Network is all about. So um, I am thrilled to turn it over to Betsy and Van. Thank you, Denise. I'm gonna start with just a brief introduction of the program. Um, Urban Greens is a program of Muskingum Soil and Water Conservation District. And we have six main gardens throughout the community. Um, out of those gardens, we are able to grow food for the community. Specifically, we work with the Hunger Network. Um, and last year, we were able to donate just over 18,000 pounds of produce to local food pantries. 
um, Veterans Center for Seniors and the Zanesville City School Summer Lunch Program. So um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, we also partner with um, several agencies to work on food education for, you know, what do you do with this produce? How is it used? Um, but just um, the overarching goal of the program is to make food more accessible to people and teach people how to grow their own food. So um, it's a pretty unique urban agriculture program for a soil and water, and we're really proud of it. And um, the farm of which Denise speaks is our largest garden site um, known as Marshall Greens. It's over an acre and a half in production. Um, it's privately owned land that we've been um, really thankful to be able to continue to use for agricultural purposes. And that's where largely a lot of our experiments take place. So um, we tell our garden coordinators and anyone who works out there, you know, gardening is just um, an experiment. And we're lucky that we have the space where we can educate people not only on conservation practices, but also um, they get to learn hands-on through experiences that they have there, which is really cool. So um, the small grains trial is kind of Van's baby. And um, so I'm gonna kind of like pass things over to him at this point and let him talk a little bit more about that aspect of our program. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Van Slack. Uh, work for the Soil and Water Conservation District here. My official title is Ag Resource Specialist, but I'm also the mad scientist on staff. Um, I want to shout out to Brian Gwynn. We were actually in college together. It's great to see him. I think I'm a little jealous. I think he has more hair than I do. So, um, But anyway, uh, Matt, one thing I wanted to mention to you, you've got a John Deere planter. Um, try taking off the no-till colder on the front and just use the um, disc opener. Um, that was a suggestion that I got from uh, Jim Hershey over in Pennsylvania when we were having trouble planting into uh, some heavy uh, rye grass. So it might be something to play with. But Thank anyway, uh, I, I think that we have um, an issue with food in the country, uh, especially with uh, all the um, uh, gluten intolerances. Uh, I was having a conversation with Jane Ann Brandt one day, and I knew that they had done a, a small plot or a couple rows of, of wheat, and uh, they offered to give me some samples to try, uh, like a pound of each, um, like Betsy said, we've got this Marshall Greens uh, garden site. Uh, this particular where the where the small grain trial is was uh, um, green beans prior to. Um, so tilled that up, um, put a uh, not much fertility. It was a product from Greenfield Farms. It was a humus and and um, micronutrient product on it and uh, I was trying to figure out how to mimic um, drilling uh, so we've got a, a single row jang planter and uh, so I tried to stay as close to seven and a half inch rows as possible um, it actually looked pretty neat once the once the wheat started coming up so I started out playing I just had some uh, feed grade oat that I planted uh, and then uh, Jay and Ann provided us with uh, barley, uh, cereal rye, um, pine corn, which is a, a old Egyptian variety that's uh, probably the most primitive form of wheat, from what I understand. Uh, banatka which was a, uh, I believe, Polish variety. And doing some research last night, it's actually a cross between, and I'm probably gonna butcher the names, but Bankuda and Ukrainka and um, Black Emmer, 
which I didn't realize it, but it dates back to biblical times also. Uh, and Rouge de Bordeaux, which is a old French variety. Um, and then also had another local farmer that gave us uh, some red fife seed, which uh, upon some research, it uh, dates back to 1842 in uh, Peterborough, Ontario. And then a, a new variety uh, out of NC State, um, Appalachian White, which was developed in uh, North Carolina to uh, grow in a, in a more humid climate, much like ours. Um, I've got, uh, try to, I don't have as uh, fancy of the presentation as Matt does. I just tried to upload some pictures on the fly and I'll share some of those. So if you look close, you can see my seven and a half inch rows. So there's the Jang planter and, and my seeds. Um, I had a little bit of an issue. I had to modify the uh, um, seed seed cup for the smaller seeds. And I got frustrated with the larger seeds. Um, the einkorn and the black emmer um, decided not to go through the, uh, the planter that well. Uh, but I was able to get some of the uh, some of it uh, planted with the planter. So roughly, I've got a or we've got a ten by twenty four plot of each that I planted with the Jang planter, and then the balance of the seed I broadcasted. Um, there's uh, some rows of the red fife uh, when it first started up. Um, once again, I think I, either Red Fife or White Appalachian. Uh, those are some pictures uh, from about two weeks out. Uh, got it planted at the beginning of October. That's probably around October 23rd, I believe. That's the einkorn, which the einkorn didn't come up real well. That's a uh, picture where it broadcasts some. Um, so we were really dry last fall. So it took a little while for the broadcast seed to come up. So there was about three weeks ago. Um, cereal rye had some... Uh, Everything was standing pretty good until we got a storm. Uh, Sierra Rye was the first victim. Um, there's a picture of the Rouge de Bordeaux. There's the Black Emmer uh, to the left of the picture. Um, is the few rows that I actually got drilled in uh, to the right is what was broadcast. There's a, that may be the Bonatka. There's the einkorn that I broadcast. I'm, that's kind of an interesting critter. Uh, seems to be relatively short, relatively small seed head. I've never been around it before. So like Betsy said, it's all an experiment. <laughs> This, uh, <clears throat> we had a guy come in and do some mowing for us and uh, they actually mowed off part of the plot. Uh, this is the barley. Uh, but what Jay and Ann suggested was to put down some white clover seed underneath to help with uh, weed control. Uh, 
after I got it planted, I went back and started figuring up. I got a little bit probably too much on because I think I, I put on about 20 pounds of the acre, which probably wouldn't be a large scale rate. And there's the Sierra Rye too that got mowed off. So one of, one of the things that I didn't get done that I wanted to was we pulled soil samples and I'm, the further I go uh, down this path, uh, the more, more convinced that I am that we can nutritionally get our crops um, well enough, healthy enough to withstand diseases, funguses, um, even standability issues with uh, copper and zinc levels um so the the two varieties there the sierra rye and the banatka that failed this year hopefully we can save some seed back i could do some some more soil testing and soil amendments and um, possibly prove out my theory um in the future uh, also you know you, you get into nutrient density issues um soil health issues uh, our our hope is or we've got it on the schedule anyway for july 20th to have a field day uh, jay and ann are coming over um, we're hoping to harvest uh, they tell me they have a portable pizza oven um, and uh, a grain grinder so we are uh, the hope and the dream is to go from standing wheat to pizza by the end of the day um but uh that's that's kind of the long and the short of it um uh, to be continued i guess so anybody have any questions comments this, concerns this is very very interesting to me i you're hitting uh i love the small grains and i've had this vision of them being grown on a meso scale not you know for for food grade uh and locally and so you're taking steps obviously in in that direction i'm curious specifically about the french uh bordeaux is that a bread wheat in france an old bread wheat or what I believe based on the um based on what Mr. Google told me last night when I was looking for things that was that was what it was was a, a um uh it's a hard red hard red winter wheat um says it makes excellent bread with a rich brown color and mellow flavor what okay. what one of the sites brought up mm -hmm. And these, uh, my understanding, all these varieties, um, people that have gluten intolerance, maybe not celiac, but gluten intolerance can, can mm -hmm. utilize them without any issues. Uh, we've got two coworkers that have gluten intolerance. Um, one of the, or who I got the Appalachian white seed from, had some flour made, they tried it and did not have any issues. So, I mean, I think that's, and, and, and look, to, to your point, uh, another reason for doing this is that, you know, if people have gluten intolerance, can they raise a small patch of small grain uh, in the backyard garden um, to provide their own flour and, and stuff for their own use? Will the uh, the the berries to flour to uh, pizza uh, experiment include different? I mean, the same pizza, the same flavor pizza uh, across different uh, of uh, flowers. Um, good point. Um, we haven't really actually gotten that far. I'm still struggling with. Um, how are we going to get it uh, harvested? Um, I've been asking everybody that I know, uh, even some Amish friends, <laughs> uh, to to have some 
I mean, I've looked on online at some DIY uh, harvesting things. Um, keep going back to a five gallon bucket and a block of wood, which is one what one guy suggested. So we'll see. It may it may take a lot longer than what we think. Um, I guess there's some other opportunities too with the with the wheat stems, uh, weaving, uh, some opportunities to sell the the, the whole wheat straw and, and heads to uh, for flower arrangements, that kind of stuff. What were you thinking, Eric? On you, you coming over? Do you have a, you have a? Well, I was thinking of putting my order pizza. in. Like I'm kind of a medium medium sauce ham, pineapple, and jalapeno kind of guy. Oh. So, if we could standardize the fl that flavor so that I could taste the bread, I'd really appreciate it. And yes, then I would be there. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll work on that. I'm kidding. And, uh, hey, it's what you're doing is awesome. What you're doing that that is uh, uh, that's awesome work that you're doing. And and uh, I've often thought about turkey red. A uh, uh, farmer colleague, client of mine. Um, you may know uh, in Archibald, her name is Valerie Kinsman. She's done some playing around with, actually, she was a Warner Grant recipient uh, also. And uh, she has done something very similar on her CSA farm. And uh, I'm not sure if she's taken the grain to the, you know, to the, the CSA customer. She's done more of a, a a flavor selection of her own, but she's the one that said, told me the turkey red is going to be the best, you know, the turkey, mm -hmm. get, get some, you know, you get some turkey red, but she's also mentioned some of these, these varieties that you have. And so um, I would be happy to put you two in touch on it because, you know, she probably has some conclusions and there's probably some sort of terroir with, uh, with small grains from Muskingum County to Fulton County. So, um, Cool, man. Appreciate all, it. Ours would have to have bladder flavor, I, I would think. <laughs> say, say that part again. I said I, I said ours would have to have better flavor, I would think. It's uh it's 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 better countryside over there. So I don't know about the water, but it's better countryside. It's probably a better view uh as you're harvesting. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we're setting up for some kind of like wheat growing pizza cook off across yes. the state of Ohio, which sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> um, so Van and Betsy, uh, we've got this whole network of people that are not all on the call today. Um, like you may have noticed we're recording and people often watch this afterwards, but if you have a, a flyer or something that we can share with the whole network um, of this event, um, to check it out. I, I think that would be really, um, really great and, and of interest um, to the group. Uh, I see Brian, Brian's got his hand yeah. up. I just, um, I don't want to disclose what they're doing, but your harvest and your milling scenario, I know Tillmore was working on some stuff for their Power Ox uh, unit. They've been on campus a couple of years ago working on harvesting tool for a plot like yours. So um, if you don't mind, I'll reach out to them, put them in touch with you uh, to see where they're willing to disclose what they've been working on. Oh, that would that would be awesome. You know, we'd even let them come down and try it out. You know? uh, yeah, they, they've they've used our wheat fields and oats fields here after plot work to uh, to to do some development. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. I was going to also offer uh, Dr. Laura Lindsay as our small grain specialist at Ohio State, and she was at one point, I'm looking on her Step Up Soy website because she also does soybeans, but um, she was doing like 45 ancient grains, uh, a test plot in, in two different places. Oh, wow. And it, it, I'm, I'm not sure if it was at Western Research Branch and Northwest, which would be up here at, we call it a Custer Northwest Ag Research mm -hmm. Station. I don't know if it was replicated in Worcester or not, but uh, for sure two sites. And I'm calling it her ancient grains quality and yield study. Um, 
the, obviously all the moving parts of the varieties. And so I think she kind of did kind of a baseline testing of yield and protein and some quality standards. But <clears throat> I can't say, I know when you mentioned einkorn, I was like, oh, Laura Lindsay had einkorn in her study. That's weird. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, it's, she had a lot of these in, in her study. Um, that was a mall. It might even been a multi-state. I'm, I'm trying to look for it. If before the call is over, if I can throw a link in, I will, but I just wanted to call your attention to that. And, uh, Laura Lindsay should get a direct, or I'd encourage us to invite Laura Lindsay to the event. That's close to, it's closer to Muskingum County than Fulton County is. Columbus is closer than, than Wauseon. Yeah. Laura's done some, uh, uh, Zoom programming for us, uh, Clifton, Martin, and I um, do a joint venture normally in January, February, and March uh, called Pizza Pop and Profits. And now we buy in pizza for that, so if we have flour, we may make our own this next year. Have you considered a career in extension? <laughs> No, I'm too crazy for that. I tease, tease Martin about uh, Clifton about uh, he has to stay on the reservation, but I can venture off every once in a while. So we're happy that that Van and Betsy partner with Extension, both OSU and CSU, because they're great partners. Um, and that you're willing to share your project with us today. And Matt, also that you're willing to share your project. Um, we all learn from each other in the network. Um, so it's great and much appreciation to all the connections people share today as well for how people can keep improving and growing and expanding their their projects. So that was great. One of the biggest- Thanks for the opportunity. Things. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Do you wanna be respectful of time because it is one o'clock, people who are starting to leave. This is recorded and it will go up on the OSU Offer website along with all of the, the past presentations too. If you haven't seen them, check them out. We're building um, a really great collection of potential research projects that can be replicated um, across the state or maybe just launch another idea for a new project too. So again, Cassie, you mentioned at the beginning that we've got our July program set, but why don't you give a quick reminder of that before we end our meeting? Sure. Um, join us on July 11th, not July 4th. So we're moving it down a week. Uh, we'll have Jordan Setledge with us. And he is an organic valley um, dairy person over in St. Mary's, Ohio, uh, Oglays County. And um, he's been testing out two different systems for like satellite imagery for managing his pasture. So he's going to talk about how he's used those to his advantage and been able to um, provide some input to improve both of those programs. So uh, great speaker, um, very excited to have them next month. So I'll send out a reminder. And if you're not on our email list, um, let me know and I will get you on there. Um, try to have a good variety of, of presenters every month. So cool. Thanks everybody. Take care. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank this you. was awesome. Have a great week.